1990 World Championship belongs to the Cincinnati Reds. Welcome to Baseball Seasons 1990. Anything can happen. In baseball, spring is a time for expectations. The results of the previous year have been properly cataloged. And the slate wiped clean with anticipation and new projections. But in 1990, no one knew what to expect when the start of the season was threatened by a dispute over the business of the game. The clubs decided to lock out. Why they're doing it, I'm not sure. Well, none of us clearly enjoy this. Hopefully, it will serve as a conduit to getting an agreement. As training camps sat empty, a lockout prevented the season from beginning until a new collective bargaining agreement was completed. The ongoing negotiations have yet to result in a new collective bargaining agreement. It was a period of a, a lot of unrest as far as the labor agreement with the ownership and the players. It was frustrating for us, it was frustrating from the fans and, and then uh, probably from, from the owners. The fact that we don't have an agreement doesn't mean the lockout failed. I guess it means that the two parties involved just don't have an agreement yet. The owners always say, well, we're paying too much, and the players always say, we want a natural progression of salary increase, and it always seems to come down to the 11th hour. Tonight, an agreement in principle has been reached. Finally, after 32 days, the impasse came to a close, with both sides appearing eager to move on without lingering acrimony. The task now, it seems to me, is to see if the wounds of this kind of a process can be healed as quickly as possible. We fervently hope that uh, baseball peace comes, and that's the last of these type of situations that we have in baseball. The regular season would be delayed, but the entire 162-game schedule was preserved. And as spring training finally began, labor talks quickly gave way to the belated promise of a new season. This is 1990. We have a new manager. We have a new attitude. We're just going to go out there and play hard every day. There's only one team at the end of the year that sits back and says, yeah, we, we did it. We're just hoping that we're going to be that team this year. I get ready for this year to win another pennant. That's, that's a big goal of mine. I want that world championship ring. Well, I'm excited to just uh, be playing baseball. One source of optimism for every team, no World Series champion had repeated in 11 years, the longest span in history. Then again, the reigning kings of the game appeared as dominant as any club in memory. After being upset by the Dodgers in the 1988 series, the Oakland Athletics had gained redemption with the title in 1989, yet they remained unsatisfied. If we play as we're capable of playing, I believe we can do this a few more times. It's going to be tough to repeat, but that'll be our plans in spring training in 90. As the defending champions prepared for the season, a third straight trip to the Fall Classic and consecutive World Series titles were in their sights. But they were also competing against history and the legacy of the great athletics teams of the 1970s. The A's are the first team since the Yankees to win three World Championships in a row. Our expectations in, in spring training were, you know, to, to create a dynasty. Will the A's win this year? There's no doubt in my mind. We understood how to go about our business, get prepared for the season. And uh, after that, it was really just getting through spring training and getting on with the season. The Oakland Athletics receive their world championship rings and then begin defense of it. I think we have the best club. I also have total respect for the competition. But if I had one club to pick, I'd pick the A's. With Ricky Henderson, Jose Canseco, and Mark McGuire powering the offense, and a pitching staff that included righty Bob Welch, perennial 20-game winner Dave Stewart, 
and the most dominant closer in the game in Dennis Eckersley. Oakland immediately charged to the top of the AL with a quick start. When you manage that ball club, you show up and you, you know, there's a little console to your right and you just push a button. You want great starting pitching, you had it. Strike three, call. You want somebody to generate some offense, we had a bunch of guys. And the A's have got the Dinger bats out tonight. And then finally, Eck. This one's done. And it's outrageous. We had a swagger. I mean, we talked about it. We, we'd come to the park every day, and we said, we're the Oakland A's, and come try to beat us. He's swaggering, I think you call that. <laughs> we wanted to crush the opponent. We wanted to put our foots in their neck. For the third straight year, the A's were imposing their will on the American League, while in the senior circuit, a pair of surprising young teams had taken control. By 1990 in Cincinnati, the glory days of the Big Red Machine were only a fading memory. And the Cincinnati Reds win in consecutive years. And after failing to make the postseason year after year in the 80s, Reds owner Marge Shaw tried to jumpstart her franchise by hiring Lou Pinella to manage the club. This is a tremendous opportunity, and I, I told Marge that I don't plan to disappoint her at all. I knew that the team had talent. Uh, they had finished second in their division three or four years in a row in the late 80s. And I knew that I was getting a ball club that could win. Lou Pinella definitely set the tone in 1990. Walks into the clubhouse and looks us up and down and says, I don't like losing, I don't accept losing, and we're not going to lose. I told these guys, I said, look, you guys are at the right age. Ready. You got the talent. That's it, Chris. Good. It's time for you all to win. You can kiss it goodbye. Bolstered by Pinella's confidence, Cincinnati began 1990 red hot. When you start out 9-0 and 33-12, and you no longer think you're good, you know you're good. We could beat you stealing a base, we could beat you with power, we beat you with defense. We thought we were unbeatable. It's easy to go out there and play when you know every day you have a chance to win. Jose Hill has pitched a two-hit shutout with 12 strikeouts. The first six weeks of the season, it seemed every time the Reds needed a big performance, someone stepped up. The two biggest threats on the roster were in center field and at shortstop, in the form of Eric Davis and Barry Larkin. Davis, he could do it all, hit for power. This ball is out of here! Hit for average, run, throw. Catcher's made, here comes Bonds, the throw by Davis. To me, he was probably the best player on that team. And then there was Larkin, who had emerged as one of the league's top shortstops. You're not going to find a better shortstop than Barry. Shot up the middle, flagged by Larkin. Got him. Oh, what a play. Oh, is he something else? He was a guy who embraced every facet of the game that was necessary to be a great all-around player. On the mound, Jose Rio was Cincinnati's best starter, but the heart of the Red staff could be found in the bullpen, where a trio of hurlers were simply nasty. One ball, two strike pitch, and this baby's over. Norm Charlton, Rob Dibble, and Randy Myers, they called them the Nasty Boys. It was intimidating knowing that you had three pitchers at any time could strike you out. Every single time they go out, they dominate. They weren't afraid to hit you. They'd throw inside. They, they were power pitchers. Oh, oh, the drills. They intimidated hitters. He's out of there. I think the thing that made those guys nasty outside of their stuff is they competed against each other. If Norm struck out the side, then Dibble wanted to come in the eighth and strike out the side. He got it. Dibble strikes out the side. If Dibble struck out the side, you know Randy wanted to strike out the side. Got it. Wow, what a job by Led by the Nasty Boys, the Reds' pen would lead the league in saves and strikeouts and also set a tone for the entire club. The confidence and the determination that they had from a bullpen filtered down to us, and we knew that if we had to leave by the sixth inning, the game was over. That was the sole reason that we broke out so quickly and built up such a big lead. A few hundred miles east at Three Rivers Stadium, 
The Pittsburgh Pirates were looking to recapture a measure of 1970s success as well. Pittsburgh wins it. After two titles in the 70s, the Bucks had struggled in the 80s. But as a new decade dawned, club manager Jim Leyland looked at his roster and saw a reason for optimism. I like talent. You know, I don't care how old they are. Talent's talent. If you get a combination of talent and experience, sprinkle in some young players and, and try to build something, and that's exactly what we did. The talent included 27-year-old emerging right-hander Doug Drayback. He was our anchor. He went out every fifth day uh, whenever he was pitching, and he knew you were going to be in the ball game and he had a chance to win. Sometimes you talk about a guy as a great competitor. Well, Doug was that, but he had great stuff, too. He was the best pitcher in the league. A good match for pitching is always defense, which the Pirates had in athletic abundance. We had uh, Jose Lind, who was just absolutely unbelievable at second base. More range than I've ever seen. Jay Bell was just a steady performer that uh, any ball that was in his range, I mean, he was going to make the play. Hard shot, Jay Bell. The Pirates were also more than well covered in the outfield. He's on the warning track. He jumps, and what a catch. Watching Andy Van Slyke in center field and Barry Bonds in left field, it was a joy. Bonds, does he have room? He does! Oh, what a catch by Barry Bonds! Andy in center field won a gold glove. Bonds won a gold glove. So we had good defense. That was the key to that team. But Leland also had the best offensive outfield in the league. In the center, Andy Vanslyke was a tough out and all-round talent. Switch hitter Bobby Bonilla was a powerful presence at cleanup. Grand slam home run for Bobby Bonilla. But the biggest threat at the plate and on the bases was MVP candidate Barry Bonds. This guy was probably the most complete player in all of baseball. See you later, huh? Anytime that you had him on the field, he could change the game. Pitch is a ball toward a second base. Barry Bonds has his second stolen base of the game. You see that he was on his way to being one of the best, if not the best player that ever played. That's just the way it was. By June, the Pirates and the Reds each had seized control of their divisions. But in 1990, nothing on a baseball field could be taken for granted. Like no other year in baseball history, in 1990, every time a pitcher picked up the ball, it seemed anything was possible. Beginning on just the third day of the season, when two Angels teamed up to make history. Well, Langston for us, um, pretty dominant, not a big guy, but he threw the ball very firm and hard. And, you know, he had a good slider also. Eight in a row now, retired by Langston. And, of course, Mike Witt. You know, we know the nasty slide and curveball that he had. They both threw the ball pretty good. Got him swinging with a curveball. Mark Langston and Mike Witt combined for a no-hitter. It was baseball's first no-hitter in more than a year. Two months later, a giant lefty flamethrower who had been traded for Langston in 1989 turned in his own hitless gem for the Mariners. I was fortunate to be there when he first started. I'd seen it before. He'd come close and dominating the game, but even the right-handers weren't catching up to him. So when he has stuff working like that, I felt like this could be that magical night. Sorry, it's over. He has done it. Randy Johnson with the first Mariner no-hitter in history. Randy Johnson was one of those guys that had the kind of stuff that he could pitch a no-hitter every time he went out there, just like Nolan Ryan. In fact, just nine days after Johnson's no-hitter, the 43-year-old Ryan made a bid for yet another no-no. I believed that he could throw one pretty much any time out. He had that kind of stuff. Well hit the center, but playable. Gary Pettis, no hits through four. Early on, he was getting outs pretty quickly, and then all of a sudden, you could see that uh, the momentum was starting to build. Crowd on its feet here. I mean, a 43-year-old throwing a no-hitter. Number six for Nolan Ryan. His sixth career no-hitter. The Express has done it once again. It's pretty special. Three weeks later, former teammates Fernando Valenzuela and Dave Stewart each took to the hill, thousands of miles apart. I did not warm up very well, and I really felt it was going to be a tough day. But 
by the fifth inning, I remember coming to the dugout, and I told Dave Duncan, these guys are going to have a tough time getting a hit today. Through five innings, the Toronto Blue Jays have no hits. My stuff was different. My fork bob was really, really, really nasty that day. Strike three call and a fork ball just dropped over the outside corner. It was his ball game. He didn't go out there to pitch six, seven innings. He went out there to pitch nine innings. And a bunch of zeros for the Blue Jays. Swing and a miss, one out away. As he closed in, others took notice from a distance. We were watching the last couple outs. When Fernando Valenzuela poked his head into our video room, Stu got the no hitter. And it's a no hitter for Dave Stewart. And he said, you saw one on TV, now you're going to see one in person. And he went out there and pitched a no hitter. The 0-2 up the middle, and they turn two. There's the no hitter. There's the no hitter. The combo of uh, Stewart and Valenzuela is you know, a pretty special day for those guys to do it. The fact that in 1990, two no hitters were thrown on the same day, uh, something never happened was uh, an amazing feat in itself, plus the fact that there were <laughs> seven no-hitters thrown that year. Actually, at the time, nine no-hitters went into the record books. Two, though, are no longer official, even if at least one of them was as distinctive as any the game has ever seen. No hits? Yep, let's watch this closely. I know it is hard to get, and when you see a guy dealing like that, uh, the last thing you want to do is, uh, you know, make the defense uh, break it up for him. Flowers drops it, now picks it up, long throw, not in time. Flowers spying the wind, drops the ball. Everybody's going to score. Jesse is there. Now he drops it. Robin scores, and the Sox lead it four to nothing. Our defense did everything possible for him not to get it. Three eighth inning errors cost Andy Hawkins and the Yankees four unearned runs. And when New York failed to score in the top of the ninth, Hawkins lost despite throwing eight no-hit frames. And the ball game is over as the Sox get no hit by Andy Hawkins, and they win it four to nothing. I don't know if it's just a, a weird year or what, but there were nine thrown that year, and I think I'm the only one of the men who's lose one. Two starts later, Hawkins faced the White Sox again in New York. But this time, opposing pitcher Melito Perez was the one throwing no-hit ball, at least until Mother Nature had her say. A rain delay. This could be very interesting right here. We were teasing everybody that, you know, that's not really a no-hitter because you went that whole uh, nine innings. Obviously, the game is official, and Melito Perez a no-hitter through six innings. Today, neither of those no-hit outings are classified as official. As in 1991, the rules were changed, requiring a no-hitter to be at least nine innings and a complete game of hitless ball. Meanwhile, 1990's no-hit fever resumed in more conventional form in August, when lefty Terry Mulholland took the mound at Veterans Stadium in Philadelphia against the Giants. I distinctly remember the last out of the game. Gary Carter hit for me, uh, hit a line drive. And he did it. It's amazing to throw a no-hitter in Philly. Uh, that was a good hit in place, and he did a masterful job. Toronto's Dave Steve had won 140 games in the 80s, second most over that span, but he'd never thrown a no-hitter, and three separate times had lost them with two outs in the ninth. Came so close so many other times. You know, one time was a bad hop single. It's a bad hop, and over Manny Lee's head in the right center for a base hit. We faced him in Toronto one time where I think he had 26 up, 26 down, and uh, uh, Roberto Kelly broke it up, two outs in the ninth with a double. Line to left field. Oh! But in the year of the no-hitter, Steve finally earned his date with hitless destiny. He has got the no-hitter, Steve. The long frustration is finally over. Felt like a weight had been lifted off my shoulders because everybody expected it after uh, all those close calls. So it was nice that no-hitter dream finally came true. There certainly isn't a more deserving pitcher to finally it was as unlikely as it was impressive. So many hitless gems in a single season, together making baseball history. I guess it was the year of the no-hitter. There were nine no-hitters pitched that year. Might have been something in the air. I don't know. In the second half of the 1980s, the Blue Jays and Red Sox had dominated the AL East, each winning two division titles. 
In the American League's Eastern Division, the Jays lead the Sox by one half game. 1990 would be no different as the two clubs battled for first place all summer long. The Blue Jays were really getting ready to be that team of the decade that just went on great runs with great talent. The Red Sox were kind of trying to still figure out where they were going, who they were. The Sox were a mixture of new and old faces as Mike Greenwell, Ellis Burks, and May acquisition Tom Brunanski bolstered a lineup that also featured Dwight Evans and five-time batting champ Wade Boggs. You're not going to win pennants with hitting. You've got to win pennants with pitching, and uh, that's what we did in 86, and that's what we did in 88. A huge part of those teams and this one was two-time Cy Young winner Roger Clemens, again dominating hitters from the mound. And he goes down. Number nine for Clemens. By 1990, we were pretty sure that Clemens was probably Hall of Fame bound if he didn't get hurt. He was the guy. Every fourth, fifth day, get the ball, you're going to win that game. And in 1990, Clemens was the only American League pitcher to finish in the top five in each of the Triple Crown categories. Swing and a miss, strike three, and the ball game is over. In Toronto, the Jays had an ace of their own, an all-star Dave Steeb, whose no-hitter was just one of 18 wins on the year. Breaking ball, got Sierra. During those years, Dave Steep was pretty much at the top of his game. During that time, his slider was working really well. Oh, oh man, the man wasn't even close. Right here, looking good. Also representing the Jays at Wrigley Field for the All-Star Game were outfielder George Bell and Kelly Gruber, who'd emerged as one of the most dangerous hitting infielders in the league. Kelly Grew would play third base as well as any third base in the league and certainly put up some great numbers when he was there. Gruber's numbers placed him among the AL's elite in 1990, along with his counterpart across the diamond, first baseman Fred McGriff. Fred over there at first, his bat, you can't say enough about that and the power that he provided. He hits this one in time to right field. Beginning on June 4th, the Blue Jays and Red Sox traded places atop the AL East 12 times. It appeared whoever finished the season hotter would win it and face the team everyone expected to win the West. The powerful Oakland A's. Deep to left field, way back, grand slam, Mike McGuire! Their lineup, of course, with McGuire and Canseco at that time were just almost impossible. Ricky at the top of the order. When I think of Ricky Henderson, I think one of the great ball players of all time. Speed, power, grace. Now in his second stint in Oakland, Henderson was putting up MVP numbers, creating runs from the leadoff spot in a variety of ways, and wreaking absolute havoc on the rest of the league. It's a home run! In 1990 in particular, if you could watch him go about his business of playing a game of baseball on a day-to-day -day basis, Man, it's just an unbelievable experience. He goes again. Here's the throw. He's in there. The A's pitching was boosted by Bob Welsh, who had a career year on the mound at age 33. <laughs> by season's end, Welch would win a league best 27 games. Welch dominated a lot of games on his own. He understood that year what he needed to do to pitch and to pitch successfully. What a job by Bob Welch. The A's also had the game's best closer in Dennis Eckersley, once again shutting down opponents and putting up remarkable numbers. The A's win, and Eckersley gets another save. They are absurd numbers, and when you look at them, you can't imagine anybody putting them together, but we kind of, I think we took it for granted. If you're good and lucky, you're great. And I was good, and I was lucky. Here it comes. Meanwhile, there were winds of change in Chicago, thanks to another super closer on the mound. And yes! He strikes it out, and the Sox win it! Bobby Thigpen saved 57 games that year. Of course, we were in the same division at the time with Oakland. We probably didn't belong in the same division with him. But the White Sox stayed close, thanks to Thigpen and some rising young starters on the mound. Right-hander Jack The team also had an infusion of youth into the lineup. We brought Robin Ventura in to play third base. It's Charlotte, good diving stop by Ventura. Writes himself and makes the play. 
The combination of Ventura and shortstop Ozzie Guillen made the left side of the infield a defensive strength for the Sox. High chopper. Guillen bare hands it and gets it. What a play by Ozzie. Just three and a half games out in August, the Sox turned to a rookie reinforcement. Frank Thomas came in August of that year to play first base. That's it hard and deep in the center field. You can't put it on the board. A home run for Frank Thomas. Yeah. All summer long, the upstart Sox stayed on the tail of the mighty A's. Yes! Yes! As the A's emerged as baseball's dominant team in the late 80s, many expected the New York Mets to be right alongside them. They were the most respected team in the division at that time, and rightfully so, after what they had done. But following the Mets' 1986 championship, the team was plagued by injuries and underachievement, only managing to win one division title over the next three years. Oh, boy! Dykstra and Wilson collide! There was something missing. There was a confidence missing. Whatever swagger they had or whatever confidence they had was clearly diminished. Still, 1990 began with a renewed optimism in New York. Got him! With former Cy Young winners Dwight Gooden and Frank Viola leading the rotation, and all-star closer John Franco anchoring the bullpen, the Mets had entered the season again as an NL favorite. I don't think anybody questions the talent we have in this team. Uh, you know, and talent overcomes a lot of things. But talent couldn't make up for the kind of mistakes the Mets were making early on. And they say safe. Watch the runner. He's not watching the runner. And Cole's still arguing. The second runner scores. With a team below 500 in late May, longtime manager Davey Johnson was fired and replaced by third base coach Buddy Harrelson. Right after Buddy took over, they were a very strong team. There's one gone. Forget it. Goodbye. In that month, they were more like the Mets of 86 than they ever were after 86. At the center of the turnaround was right fielder Daryl Strawberry. Darrell was hitting three run home runs every other day, and we were winning dramatically. The Mets had their winning streak to 11 consecutive ball games to tie a Mets record. The Mets' signature swagger had returned, and the team quickly clawed back into the NL East race to challenge the Pirates. Another comeback win for the Mets. If the Mets' turnaround was perhaps expected, in Kansas City there was hardly much hope for George Brett. In April, May, I, I struggled so bad with talk shows, the newspapers, suggesting that I might be over the hill. I might have played, you know, my, this might be my last year. At 37, it appeared Brett would be unable to combat the naysayers until suddenly he did. I just got hot, and I've always been a streaky player. And once I started getting some hits, the average went from 250 to 260, 260 to 270. Probably had the best second half of my career. Brett Surge increased his average to 329, good enough for his third and perhaps least likely batting title. What a difference. The second half of the season is meant to it. The NL batting champion, meanwhile, was even more improbable, considering he left the league with a month to go in the season. McGee belts it. Willie McGee was hitting 335 for the Cardinals when he was dealt in late August to Oakland to bolster an already ferocious A's lineup. Base hit for Willie McGee, who can fly. McGee had already earned enough NL plate appearances to qualify, and his mark stood up for his second batting title in absentia. Way to go, Willie! In Detroit, the headlines surrounded a player who had harnessed his power during a year abroad. Cecil Fielder, he was fun to watch. He could hit a ball the country mile. Long drive, deep left field, that's it! On the roof, over the roof! The former Blue Jay had hit 38 home runs in 1989 in Japan's Central League. When he came back from Japan, he was a different guy, had a different swing. He went off on a tear, and not only was he hot, it wasn't streaky, it was consistent. So consistent that Fielder made a bid for the game's first 50 home run season in 13 years, the longest such drought in history. Well, he has done it again. In game 162, Fielder's home run total stood just shy of the vaunted benchmark at 49. <laughs> at Yankee Stadium, Fielder smashed two home runs to finish with 51. Just one of several exciting finishes to the 1990 regular season.
As the September stretch run began in 1990, the White Sox hopes of upending the A's all but disappeared when Oakland strengthened its already formidable lineup. It was great morale. It was a boost in our clubhouse, getting Harold Baines and a Willie McGee. Those were things that makes you unquestionable favorite. I gotta go to work, man. It was unquestionably a deep and dangerous lineup, headlined by eventual MVP Ricky Henderson, who led the team to a major league best 103 wins. The A's win, and Eckersley gets another swing. Shutting the door on many of those wins was Dennis Eckersley, who had 48 saves and a microscopic 0.61 ERA for the division champs. No one had to motivate me. There wasn't a better year I've ever pitched in my life. But motivation may have been a problem for the Cincinnati Reds, who struggled to play 500 ball after their brilliant start. The Cincinnati Reds, who started out 30 and 12 at the beginning of this year, have fallen on some hard times. Well, the move with us was okay. Lou, the one that was panicking. Well, we were 50 and 51 after our fast start, but uh, nobody really got close to us till probably the third week in September. High fly ball, left field, Giants sweep the Reds. The Giants and Dodgers both made late runs in the NL West, but thanks in part to stellar late season pitching by Jose Rio, the Reds held them off. Jose. You know, from July on was as good as any pitcher I've been around. You know, he had the pitch that was basically unhittable, and that was a slider. You're not going to hit that pitch. Forget it. The Reds also benefited from 16 second-half starts by Norm Charlton, one of the trio of nasty boys in the team's bullpen. He could be a long man. He could close ball games, and he could be a situational pitcher. He could start. And he definitely exuded the confidence to go out and eat up a bunch of innings. Meanwhile, in the pen, Rob Dibble and Randy Myers continue to dominate hitters, and the Reds would become the first NL team in the expansion era to spend the entire season in first place. You know, we've done something nobody in the National League's ever done. That's wire to wire, and everybody who participated, whether it be one day or the whole season, should be damn proud of that. In the NL East, it was a battle between New York and Pittsburgh. The Mets stayed strong through the summer, thanks to Daryl Strawberry and his 37 home runs. Way back and way out of here! Considering the Mets had won two division titles in the last five years, most observers favored New York. The Mets had a more veteran team. In September, you tend to look at the more veteran team and say, well, they're, they're going to get this done. In the case of the Pirates, they had so much talent. I mean, they just couldn't touch him. The most talented pirate was Barry Bonds, who'd broken out in a performance that would earn him his first MVP. Hello, 3050 Club. Take that base hole, Barry. On September 5th, separated by just half a game, the teams faced off, and against John Franco, it would be Bonds who'd have the final word. Barry swings a fly ball. The Mets never would catch the box. And Pittsburgh would clinch the division three weeks later behind Cy Young winner Doug Drabeck. The Pirates defeat the St. Louis Cardinals, and there was no doubt about it. In the American League, the Red Sox and Blue Jays battled for the Eastern Division crown all the way down to the wire. So you had this late September series with the Red Sox and Blue Jays, very critical. And the Red Sox had this outfielder that no one had heard of. Jeff Stone comes up. Stone has not had an at-bat. He's appeared in seven games. He needs to make contact, and he does. The unlikeliest of heroes puts the Red Sox in first place. Five days later, fate continued to smile down on the Sox when Toronto lost its final game of the season, giving Boston a chance to clinch with a win. Boston three. Chicago one with two outs in the top of the line. The White Sox with runners at first and second. Line down the right field line, hooking toward the corner. Brunanski! I couldn't see whether he caught it or whether the ball hit in the stands or whether it was a home run. 
know, you kind of looked at the fans and their reaction kind of told you that he had caught the ball. Yeah, he made the catch in the corner. A great catch by Geist in 1990. For the second time in three years, the Sox would be underdogs in a division series against the A's. But as October would show, the game of baseball has a habit of disregarding expectations. Entering the 1990 ALCS, the Oakland A's appeared to have the edge over Boston in almost every way. One advantage, though, would prove most critical. We'd like to blow everybody up if we kept the game close. We knew our bullpen was better than anybody else's. We had Honeycutt and, then of course, finished with that. Just keep it close, get the starter out of there, and get to the other team's bullpen and take our chances. Game one began as a pitcher's duel between Dave Stewart and Roger Clemens. But after the Sox removed Clemens up 1-0 going to the seventh, their suspect bullpen imploded, giving up seven runs in the ninth. Here's the 0-1 and a shot hit to center field. Base hit. Two more runs will come across. And even an eight-run lead wasn't too much for Eckersley to protect. If you look at it from the Red Sox underdog standpoint, this is a worse kind of defeat they could have. One in which they had hope they were leading. The Sox took another early lead in game two, but again, the A's responded. Now an insurmountable, it would seem, two games to none lead for the Oakland Athletics. In game three in Oakland, the A's continue to hammer the Sox, earning a three games to none series lead. They've gotten a one nothing lead in all three games, and you guys have shut the door all three starters. Well, we've been able to do that all season long. It's not like, you know, this is something new to us. The next day, the Red Sox frustration boiled over when the team's ace took the mound. No one believes this, but I have three witnesses. On the way to the ballpark, I told people in the car I was riding in that I had a dream that Roger Clemens was going to get ejected, people piling on each other and trying to pull Roger away from the umpire. And it happened. What's going on? It looks like Cooney has thrown somebody out of the game. Roger thought he had a couple of strikes that were called balls by Terry Cooney, the umpire, and he just started you know, yelling stuff at Cooney, and it just got crazy. What we watched uh, and unfolded at that point was probably the most bizarre thing I've ever seen from a player. And now Clemens has charged the umpire. I've never seen a guy, you know, go after someone like that and had to be restrained, and nobody can figure out why. He almost bumped him. Morgan is trying to restrain him. Obviously, Clemens has been thrown out. We've got a nasty scene here. It was kind of scary to watch, and, uh, you know, this day didn't last very long. When the dust had settled, the A's had taken a commanding early lead, and soon Oakland's sweep was complete. And the A's win the pennant for the third straight year. At the top of their game, there was only one question left for the A's, who their opponent would be in the World Series. Despite having led the NL West wire to wire, the Reds entered the playoffs as underdogs. We honestly believed that Pittsburgh was the best team in baseball that year. So, you know, we knew that we had our hands full with those guys. They had such a potent offense. They had very good pitching. We knew we couldn't make many mistakes, and we had to take it to them. But in game one, the Reds struggled against Pirate starter Bob Walk. In game two, though, the momentum would shift on a single throw. Van Swyke will tag at second. There's the catch, and the runner moves on to third base, and... That's a double play. Anytime that you can gun a guy out, whether it's the first inning or the eighth inning, uh, it, it leads to something. It prevented them from being able to score runs. That really changed this inning and this game. And following three hitless innings by the Reds' bullpen, the series was even. Then, as play moved to Pittsburgh, the Reds grabbed two more wins and a commanding series lead. Try called, and the game is over. The Reds lead three games to one. With their backs to the wall, the Pirates turned to Cy Young winner Doug Drayback in game five, hoping to extend the series at least one more game. And in game six, the Reds grabbed a late one-run lead. Cincinnati lead. Then, in the ninth, the Pirates made a bid to go ahead off Randy Myers. I think what a lot of people remember in game six, Carmelo Martinez. It's a fly ball to deep right field. Looked like it could be a home run. 
Glenn Braggs in right field for the Reds leaps up. And he has it for the second out. How close was that? I thought it's a home run, I believe, had he not been there. You're right. That was a huge play, quelled a pirate rally, and the Reds went on to win. And he struck him out swinging. Just knowing the confidence that we had, a lot of people don't give us a lot of credit for believing in ourselves. Everybody thought that we were the underdog, but we really believed that we were capable of winning every game that we played. And their thoughts will now turn to the World Series. It has been some kind of season for this ball club. As the 1990 World Series began, it was hard to find anyone in baseball who thought the A's would be threatened by the Reds. I have to admit that I think I predicted the A's to win in about five games. I mean, they pretty much crushed everybody in the American League, and even though the Reds had surprised everybody, I thought that was a fluke. I thought that Oakland would take them apart. But in game one in Cincinnati, it quickly became clear the Reds wouldn't be rolling over when Eric Davis stood in against Dave Stewart in the first. Fly ball to deep, deep center field. McGee back. It's going to go. Why, you would think they just won the World Series. People talk about my home run set the tone, but if Jose Rio don't come out and pitch the way he pitches, they're not even talking about my home run against Dave Stewart. State to a lead. Rio kept the Oakland bats at bay with seven scoreless innings. And the Reds can do no wrong. After six and a half innings, Red seven, eight. Rob Dibble and then Randy Myers finished off the shutout. And the Reds have beaten the A's in game one. Cincinnati seven and the A's nothing. That's a big win for me and for my team. Just the fact that I read so much about how favorable the Oakland A's are. It's a big win because we showed to ourselves that we can beat them. Game two would be a closer affair as the A's took a 4-2 lead early on what would be Jose Canseco's lone hit of the series. And he hits a high drive into deep right. Back goes O'Neal, away back, he's gone. But the Reds rallied to tie it, leaving the game up to the team's bullpens. And after two nasty boys hurled three scoreless innings, it was up to Dennis Eckersley to do his part in the tenth to preserve the tie. This is not a great situation to be in. His control was phenomenal and he'd had such an extraordinary year that you did not want to see him out there on the mound. But then, improbably, the Reds found a way. Billy Bates comes off the bench, gets a pinch hit single in the bottom of the 10th inning. Chris Sabo singles into second. Joe Oliver drives him in with a memorable hit down the left field line. That ball is fair! Cincinnati's ahead! Two games to go! Two games down, people expect us to win, and uh... Pressure's on us big time. I think the A's probably thought, all right, we're going back to our stadium. We got you now. Well, not so. In Oakland, the A's nightmare continued as the Reds' bats broke out for seven runs in the third inning of game three. Larkin hits one in the gap, and that won't be caught. It is eight to two, and these Reds are pounding that ball. We just knew we had to get a game in Oakland. When you have an opponent down, you want to keep them down. So it was no let up. Aided by three more scoreless innings by their bullpen, the Reds cruised again. And that's the way this one ends, and Cincinnati leads it three games to nine. On the brink of a sweep, the Reds sent Jose Rio back to the mound to battle Dave Stewart. But early on, things didn't bode well for Cincinnati. Oh, he was hit by that one. Billy Hatcher goes down, and that one had to hurt. And it only got more painful for the Reds from there. This one in the left center. That's fair. And it is a caught. Now it's dropped by Davis. He's hurt. I went to dive. I tried to protect my shoulder, and I caught the ball and rolled, and my elbow went up under my rib cage and lacerated my kidney in three places. Look at Eric Davis. He's gone from bad to worse. Game four, losing Eric Davis and losing Billy Hatcher, we knew we needed to finalize a series right then and there. Trailing 1-0, Rio kept the A's from extending their lead. Then in the eighth, Stewart finally cracked, and the Reds jumped ahead. And a high fly ball to right will put Cincinnati on top. The runner tags, they could never throw him out. The throw goes into second base, and it's 2-1 Cincinnati. Rio finally gave way with one out in the ninth, leaving a nasty boy to fittingly finish the job on the mound. Popped 
backed up into short right. Foul ball. Bensinger wants it. Cincinnati, the champions of baseball for 1990. When he catches the ball and everybody converged, it was like, oh my goodness, we've done what no one said we could do, but we did what we planned to do. With an improbable sweep over Oakland. It was one of the most stunning World Series in years. While Rio was named MVP, the Reds' bullpen hadn't allowed a single run. And Billy Hatcher had sparked the offense with a single series record, seven straight hits. We just came out, we played better baseball than they did. They might be the best team, but we're the world champions. The Cincinnati Reds have done the absolute improbable, and they've done it in a four-game series sweep. The red shocking victory shook the foundation of Oakland's would-be dynasty. With injuries derailing their big sluggers and an otherwise aging lineup, the A's wouldn't make consecutive postseasons again for a decade. And it's plenty consecutive victories for the Oakland Athletics. When they did reemerge, it was with a very different philosophy, Moneyball. The emerging talent of the Reds, meanwhile, started talk of a new dynasty in Cincinnati. But the club's pitching faltered in 1991, and many key pieces of the roster could never repeat the magic of 1990. Barry Bonds and the Pirates would win the next two NL East titles. The Pittsburgh Pirates have won their third straight division title. But lose each time in the playoffs to a new National League power. Even as other contenders would emerge in the years to come, 1990 remains an indelible season, both with prodigious power and a, number 50 for Central Fielder. And a series of stellar pitching performances that reminded us that anything can happen on a baseball field.